Well, welcome back. I got my drink of water, have my potty break, and uh, coming back. <laughs> wow, what a, a crazy, crazy month of March. They definitely came in roaring like a lion. Hopefully, April coming in like a lamb will happen, but it might be a loud lamb <laughs> that's coming in. But what has happened with this march and this, uh, there isn't a march madness, but we're having that. And uh, it has brought in a lot of fear. It's brought in a lot of worry, of anxiety, and a whole bunch of chaos. It's brought all of those, we've experienced them before, but they brought it, this has brought them to a whole new level, a whole new experience. Do you realize that it was just five weeks ago? Just sit on that for a second. Five weeks ago, just 35 days, there was only 30 reported cases for COVID-19 in the United States. And the other thing is, the joke was, all across media was, everybody was making jokes about a toilet paper. But now just in a two week period there, as we're looking at empty shelves in the stores, we're not making jokes about the toilet paper anymore. We're not laughing about it. This is serious. Think about it, just two weeks. That's only 14 days. We were introduced to social distancing, which we're not good at. No gathering of groups of more than 10, and where sometimes that might be appealing to us, that's not our nature. Restaurants, limited to just a drive through You can't go in and sit down and eat. There's no more going to the movies. No more uh, going to concerts. Uh, ben Calhoun had a, a family concert from his living room last night on, on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and I think it said he put it on Zoom too. Just simply because his... Uh, his whole spring and, and who knows how long, not just Citizen Way, but all of these uh, groups, uh, all their tours have been canceled. And he's enjoying this time just being with his family, and writing music and getting that reconnected back, uh, that connection back because the, the world is just closed in on him. It's just a hectic pace. It, it has done that for all of us. And I enjoyed that last night, just just watching and listening to Ben. Schools are closed down. Parents are having to take up homeschooling basically. Work from home became a norm for us where it's possible. And the church, well, the church, the church looks in a, a has a whole new look about it. But we could handle two weeks, right? But now that two weeks have been extended to the end of April. And who knows how much further than that they will go. We live under a shelter in place on the Texas side. You stay at home except for what is essential and that is a vague word there. What essential activities? Work, going to get groceries, medical. Our students are having to learn new ways of learning at home. Teachers are having to learn a new way of teaching from home. Just being in front of a computer screen. And for us old pastors, 
And I was thankful last week to, to hear some young pastors say that this is intimidating to them too, uh, standing in front of a uh, camera. Ministry has taken on a whole new meaning here. And it has caused us a fear and a worry, anxiety, chaos, and it's even brought on panic. I think that a lot of us have uh, adopted the, the, the thought, kind of a, a form of what uh, Charlie Brown once said in one of his comic strips. He said, I, I have a new philosophy. Only one, I only dread one day at a time now. Now, we might chuckle at that, but that might be an improvement for some of us. Truth is, fear, worry, anxiety, they rarely are satisfied with just one day at a time. They want to overwhelm us. They want to change our life, affect our life, and be Lord over our life. Ed Welch, he wrote a book that was called Running Scared. And in that, he had this quote, fear is natural to us. We don't have to learn it. We know that, don't we? We experience fear and anxiety even before there is a logical reason for them. As parents, we never have to teach our children to, to sin. They just do that naturally. We don't have to teach our children to lie. We teach them to tell the truth, but they still lie. It's a natural part of, of them. It's a safety mechanism. And we don't have to teach them to be afraid. It just comes natural to them. Welch points out that no matter how hard we shield them from scary things on TV, maybe uh, spooky stories or other things that might frighten them, they still have fear. But think about it. We haven't helped them very much in this. Some of the children's stories we tell them are crazy. Like the three little pigs and a wolf that is constantly making them homeless. How about Hansel and Gretel? Candy house. Every kid's dream, and a lot of us adults might dream about a candy house too. But then we're introduced to a wicked witch that wants to eat them. And how about the, the three blind mice chasing a lady? And then the lady chasing them, cutting off their tails with a knife. And, and what about the gingerbread man? Run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. He needed to run fast because he was being chased by a man, a woman, a pig, a cow, and a butcher with a knife. And ends up meeting a fox that does end up eating him. These are the stories we tell our children. How could our children not be afraid? These stories, but these stories, they don't create the fear. They just connect them to fear. Oh, now I know the reason why I'm afraid. There are things out there that want to eat me, hurt me. There's pigs, cows, witches, poison apples, monsters, Dragons, I knew it. It just gives us a connection for that fear that we have in us. I heard about a little boy who was scared of the dark and his mom asked him to one night to go out on the back porch and, and to get the broom. But it was dark outside and with his fear of the dark, he didn't want to do that. Now, his mother had always told him that God was everywhere. 
So that meant that God was also on the back porch. So the little boy mustered up the courage to go to the back door and he cracked the door open fearfully just a little bit. And he whispered through the crack in the door, God, since you're already out there, could you hand me the broom, please? <laughs> yeah, we laugh. But we try to get, uh, manipulate ourselves around fear. All of us can share stories from our childhood of fear. Afraid of the dark, afraid of the doctor, afraid of monsters that supposedly are in the closet. <laughs> I don't know if you remember back in the day, Bill Cosby recorded a whole bunch of his little monologues and so forth, and he had one that was called Snakes Under the Bed. And I remember in that, his, his fear of that, them snakes being under the bed and, and uh, him saying, snakes, I've got to go to the bathroom. I'm gonna stick my toe out there, don't you bite it. Don't you bite it. Fears. All of us have them in us as a child. The problem is that as we've grown up, we seldom outgrow those fears. They just get more sophisticated. They get a new facade on them. We, we give them scientific names to make us feel like we're normal with those fears. And now, as we are facing this global pandemic of this coronavirus, all of us are experiencing that childlike fear again. We just don't know what is under the bed. We just don't know what is in the closet, what is around the corner, what tomorrow is going to bring. All of that's simply because of the unknown that we have. Our fears, our anxieties, they tell us that we live in a dangerous world. We fear because something inside of us says that the world is broken, and it is. We are not as big and as strong and, and self-sufficient as we think we are, and we're reminded of that right now. We are not in control. Life has a way of reminding us of that truth, doesn't it? We are reminded of that now in this time. Shelter in place. Limit on movement. Limit on social interactions. Our jobs and our finances, they hang by a thread. In church and ministry, we always it's facing new challenges. Just like that, in a month time, two weeks actually, every pastor is a televangelist. And trust me, this one is pretty uncomfortable with that. I don't like having my face put all over your computer. You might not either. Because of all of these, we worry. Because of all these, we're afraid. And we let that anxiety swell up inside of us. Why do we do that? Because we just don't know. Back to Ed Welch's book, Running Scared. He writes, fear and anxiety are running from something. They just don't know where they're running to. They don't know where to find peace and rest. But we as the sons and daughters of the king, we do. And I'm here to remind us again, remind myself again, that we do know where to find rest and peace. Throughout the scriptures, we are reminded of where to find peace and rest even in troubled times. A world that is filled, filled with tribulation, when we're in a world of uh, 
pandemic panic. Jesus tells us in, in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me, that's Jesus, you may have peace. Peace in this world, you will have trouble, tribulation, there will be tough times. But take heart, I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Our scripture today is that we're going to be focusing on is from the Psalms, and the Psalms has a whole lot to say about uh, the worries and and uh, fears that we uh, face in is this world in this world. So Psalms forty six. God is our refuge and strength, an ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her to break at the break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the mouth, earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear and he burns the shields with fire. And he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now looking closer at these first three verses, there's some events here that are pretty scary. They're not some kind of a, a minor setback. No, they're not some kind of a, a little inconvenience. These uh, events are life-altering, life-threatening even. The earth gives way, trembles, shakes, quakes, mountains collapse into the sea. And then verse 6, remember, nations are in an uproar. These are the serious events. They describe the destruction of all the things that seem to be undestructible, things that we always think is go always going to be there. But all of a sudden, they're not. Events that fill our hearts with a, an uneasiness that cause our, our courage to take flight like a, a frightened little bird. All of us at one time or another have walked through some frightening and devastating events in our life that took up, that took us totally off guard. We're not expected. We know that fear, that fear of living life with, with worry, that a life of, of dancing with anxiety, A life that, like David writes earlier, of walking through the valley in the shadow of death. Seems like over the last year, we've talked about that quite a bit here in, in the Texarkana Church. But even in these life-altering events, we do not have to be afraid. The psalmist says here in verse two, that we will not fear. Are you serious? You see what's going on all around us, God? How can we not fear? We don't have to fear because we know who he is. 
and that he is for us, that he will protect us and carry us through this. I read about a, a little odd animal from Africa. It's called the, the rock badger. Yeah, I know, oh, it's so cute. <laughs> This, uh, you can think of him kind of as a little guinea pig, maybe, with short ears and a tail. And you find these in different places in Africa and even parts of the, the Middle East. And you can probably guess where, where they live. They live in the rocks. Uh, the rocks provide a safe place for them, an escape, a protection from the predators. Their natural color of a gray and some brown in there helps them to blend in with the rocking, rock surroundings around them. When a predator comes, they scurry off into a gap, into a cleft in the rock, and it provides safety for them. If a bird of prey wants to snack on them, they just, they must catch the badger before he gets to the safety of the rocks. The farther that the farther from the rocks that the badger ventures, the more vulnerable he becomes. It doesn't matter how courageous the little little guy is. It doesn't matter how fast that he thinks he is. It doesn't matter if he can, he says like the gingerbread man, run, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm the rock badger. It doesn't matter if he gets too far from the rocks. Fortunately, the badger is wise enough to know that its strength lies, its security lies, not with what he can do, but with the mountain shelter, what the mountain shelter can do for him. He knows where to run. And then as we face these, these devastating tragedies, losses and life-altering events, the psalmist said, we will not fear. Not because we are strong enough, not because we're wise enough or brave enough or resilient even enough but because we know where to run. We will not fear because we have a God who invites us to take shelter in him. That is where our hope is at, even in these troubling times. Fear may be common. It may be a natural part of us, but in God's presence, fear fades away. The psalmist in Psalms 91 says it like this. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will, and here's that one of those I wills that I've been trying to get you to underline whenever you see them in Scripture. That is a promise from God, and we know that none of his promises are ever broken. He says, I will, says the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence and from the coronavirus. Verse four, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the dark, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Why? Because we are his. He is our refuge. He is our strength. He is our fortress. And he is our ever-present help, always there. With that, I, re I read one place, an illustration for this that I thought was really good. 
Uh, have you ever gone to a store that say you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, something along that line, and you've had a question about a product or or what you were really needing to to get or maybe how to to use a certain product, whatever. And so you start looking for a salesperson to help you, only to discover that there's no help around. Well, in a lot of those stores, they have these little red buttons in different areas of the store that you push, and there's this voice that comes out and announces to all of the store that you need help. And you push it, it says, help needed in plumbing, help needed in plumbing, Yep, okay, the message is out. Surely, certainly, assuredly, someone will come. So you wait, and you wait, then you wait. You know help is somewhere in the building, but it is not present to help. It's not easily found. Now in our time of need, we have a God who is our refuge, our strength, an abundant helper that is, can actually be found. We don't have to press a button for that help. Hope that God, and hope that God is not on a, a lunch break or is taking a nap not have to, to hope that heaven is understaffed and not able to help in that particular day. Jeremiah writes in Jeremiah 33, this is what the, the I'm behind, I guess. There we go. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me, he says, and I will answer you, and you will you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. He's always there, waiting on for you to call out. The psalmist reminds us that we can run to God for shelter in the midst of life's storms. And he will provide the, the strength and the help. And he's always available, always accessible. He's our everlasting and never-ending source of joy. And joy is what feeds our hope. Look, when our lives are under attack, we have access to a continuous source of that joy. One that no enemy, no circumstance, no coronavirus can cut off because joy does not flow from our circumstances that we are in, but from the very throne of God. Found in God, in a God who does not bow or bend to the tribulations of this world. Back to Psalms 46, <clears throat> excuse me. Nations are in an uproar. Do you see that? Nations are in an uproar. And kingdoms fall. He, in speaking of God, lifts his voice and the earth melts. God speaks and the sound of his voice causes them to melt away. God is not moved or afraid of the events of this world. He's not afraid or moved by the boasting or the pounding of the chest of nations, striving for power and dominance and control. They operate under the delusion that they are in control, but we know better. All it takes is one word from our great God and the nations will fall to their knees. The earth will melt. Verse 8, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. 
He makes war cease to the ends of the earth, and he breaks the bow and shatters the spear, and he burns the shields with fire. Look, God is in control of even the greatest tragedies that we can, can ever imagine. Even this global pandemic, God's got it. God is with us. He has not abandoned us. He is with us. And we're reminded of this in, in verse 7 and in verse 11, twice in this psalm. The phrase comes up, the Lord Almighty is with us. Which reminds us then to be still. Be still and know that I am God. Here's a couple more of those I wills, those promises to underline. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Remember a few years back, and probably more than a few years, I'm probably dating myself, there was a popular slogan that was going around in the Christian circles. It said, let go and let God. We saw it on bumper stickers and on t-shirts, on coffee mugs and, and on plaques. And I was kind of surprised. I, I didn't know where that originated from, but apparently it uh, originated with Alcoholics Anonymous. And it made me think as I, as I saw that it, what is that about? It is people that are struggling with addictions, whether it's alcohol or, or drugs or, or whatever. And their little slogan that they were saying is, let go and, and let God. But it's not just, people aren't just addicted to alcohol or, or to, to drugs or pornography, we can also get addicted to, and you know those people, we can get addicted to worry, to fear, to anxiety. We dwell on them so much that they consume our life, and they almost become a god to us, an idol that we place before our good, good father. How do you break that? You let go and let God. That's what verse here in, in the last verse there in, in uh, Psalms 46, or next to the last verse, in Psalms 46 is basically saying is be still and know that I'm God. Let go and know that I am God. It's interesting that in the Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew scholar in any kind of a way, but I have read others that have studied into it. And I, I found this pretty cool, that, that the verb that is there in the be still, I got the wrong slide here, I think. But anyways, that verb there, be still, it can be interpreted as to let drop or to let go. So then, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the psalmist was trying to say, let go and know that I am God. Or a more condensed form of this maybe, let go and know God. All of us are going through this, these, these crazy, crazy times whether you're struggling with a, as a small business owner, or maybe you're facing unemployment, maybe you are unemployed, a student or a teacher, whether you're a preacher or a lay person that's having to try to figure out this technology, maybe a medical person trying to do their job, but also to stay safe themselves, or maybe a government worker trying to keep everyone calm throughout this pandemic, throughout this storm, or whether you're a family that's run out of toilet paper, 
We are all involved in here in some way or other. And what we all need to simply be reminded of is to let go and know God. What is it that enables us to let go of our fears, to let go of our worries that cause the anxiety that we're feeling, to let go of our need to be in control of things or by our being controlled by our own power or our own efforts? It's our knowledge of that good, good Father. It's our knowledge of God. Psalms 46 reminds us that God is our refuge and our strength, that he is a very present help in trouble. He is the Lord of the armies of the heaven, and he is the one that is working on earth. The more that we know that God is these things, the more we experience God's power, his presence, his protection, his peace, his rest, and his hope. Being still is just a matter of, is not just a matter of being quiet, being in a still state. It's also just slowing down all of our rushing minds. It's a, a calming of our racing hearts. And it's listening rather than babbling. Being still is making ourselves available then to the Spirit of God to work in us and to work through us. It is a surrendering of our will to his will. So in these troubling times, my message to you this morning is to let go and let God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, this reminder that all of us need, that I have needed this week. Just this reminder of what I already knew, what we already knew, that you are our refuge, that you are our strength, and that you are always present with us even in these troubling times. How we praise you for who you are and for making yourself known to us. Help us, Father, to let go of all these worries, these fears, to let go of all this anxiety and quiet our hearts. Help us, Father, to know you more through this. Remind us of your unfailing goodness, your unfailing faithfulness, and that you do, we do indeed belong to you. Help us, Father, to stay faithful to you through all of this troubled times. And Father, by your grace, carry us and equip us to fulfill the purpose that you have for us in bringing you glory. To bring, we pray that you bring your kingdom here on earth. Father, that your glory would be seen. Help us not to shy away from what you ask us to do. in your kingdom for your glory. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I pray for a good restful Sabbath for you today. And I pray that this has been a reminder to you of the hope that we do have. Yes, we look at the news and, and it's crazy. I didn't give any final numbers because they change constantly from day to day, not just day to day, hour to hour. But there's nothing to fear for God is our hope. He is our refuge. He is our shelter.
He is the warmth. He gives us the strength to carry through. So let go. Drop the mic and let God do his thing. Have a great Sabbath.